turn from Luke's Gospel, sorry, um, chapter 4, Luke's Gospel, um, chapter 4. It's lovely to have the Reverend David Hagen with us again, brother, and your family. So I'm going to ask you, would you just come and just pray for us again, and just commit this uh, time to the Lord, that the Lord would open our hearts. You know, it's quite possible that the Lord's calling you to Elam service, brother. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> I will, you okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll just pray. Father, thank you that we can fellowship together. Thank you that we are all one in you. And thank you, Father, for this, this church. We thank you for Neil and for Julianne and for the elders here, for those in leadership here, for the youth leaders, for all those who help out in different ways, for the, the members of the of the church here and for for folks who, who are visitors like, like ourselves. And Father, we thank you for the fellowship that we've been able to enjoy together with your people here over these last weeks. And Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you want us to be fed upon your word, to get into your word, and to renew our minds in your word. And we pray that you would help us to do that again today. We pray that you will give Neil, great liberty as he speaks today, great freedom, and Father, that there will be a real Holy Spirit anointing here, and that we will be open to everything that your Holy Spirit has for us today and in the days ahead. And Father, for any of us who have experienced brokenness just in maybe in recent days or weeks or months or whatever it happens to be, Father, help us to realize that it's often that those who are broken that God chooses to use in wonderful and amazing ways. So help us just to be open to the voice of your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak to us very clearly, not only through your word, through your servant today, but in the days ahead to hear what you would have us do and what you've called us to in the days ahead for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Neil. Thanks, you. Thank you, David. Yes, so Luke's um, Gospel, chapter 4, please, this morning. Our title is Godly Habits That Lead to Godly Service. Godly Habits That Leads to Godly Service. To serve the Lord, as many of you know, is challenging. It's difficult. Um, it's nice when we meet like this and we have times of worship and the joy of the Lord's in our midst. But the reality of ministry in your life personally is quite a different story. There will be many, many things that we've looked at already that will challenge you, that will seek to strip you up when you're, when you're, when you're walking, to stop you going on with the Lord, and certainly stop you going on to godly service. We've seen that already in recent weeks where Jesus was into the wilderness. Satan tried to destroy his ministry right at the very outset of that ministry. Make no mistake about it. Any man or woman wants to go on for the Lord, you will be challenged. You will be tested you will be tempted, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be proved. We're never proved in our own merit. We're proved through the Spirit of God. And as I speak to you this morning, I'm going to be drawing out some simple truths, what I see in the life of Jesus. Some of them are, are so simple, in fact, but yet many, many believers don't follow them. But what I see, what I'm about to share is I see some, some godly habits that the Lord Jesus had. And through them godly ha habits, what I see in a he entered into a greater ministry. A door was open for greater ministry. And I believe that the path that he sh has led is for us to follow. That means godly habits is very important in the life of a believer. And without godly habits, there'll be no godly service. Is that fair to say? It doesn't mean we can't serve God. We're talking about godly service. People who are anointed by God, who hear from God, and see great things done by God through their life. So let us start reading Luke's chapter Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through. So Jesus entered Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside, for he was teaching in their synagogue, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as, he was, custom, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. On rolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed or the captive free, and to proclaim the, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. We know the Lord will bless the reading of his word. So what we've already learned is that Jesus walked in the power of the Spirit Church. Now, this is not just another talk. I want us to see this this morning. Let us try and focus our mind to see what we can learn and glean from the Scriptures. We, we are told that Jesus walked in the power of the Spirit, and by doing so, I believe that he paved the way for his church to follow. Of course he did. There is nothing that is recorded in Scripture. It is in there as instruction and direction for the church. And if you desire to follow Christ, all we need do is to consider how Christ lived and what he taught and follow him. It sounds so easy, but yet it's not just as easy as it sounds. And last week I, I shared a statement that was made about Moody. And I want to share it again today. So we can consider how Moody followed the Lord Jesus Christ on his example and in return ser served the Lord with his life. It said this, Moody was going to have a mission in England and an elderly pastor protested against it. He said, why do we need this Mr. Moody? He's uneducated. He's inexperienced, etc. Who does he think he is anyway? Does he think he has a monopoly in the Holy Spirit? And a younger, much wiser pastor stood to his feet and says, no, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. What I see is this, that Mr. Moody sowed to the Spirit through godly habits. And his godly habits led him into a greater, much deeper, much fruitful godly service. See, we can all serve God, and I've done so myself many years throughout my Christian life, when perhaps I wasn't just where I ought to be. Perhaps I just wasn't listening to the, the voice of the Spirit as I ought to be, or, or I was doing my own thing and I just squeezed it in there, and we all can be guilty of this sort of ministry. But I see here a man who disciplined himself in the daily life by godly habits. He sowed to the Spirit. We already covered that. And I believe that all who sow to the Spirit will learn godly habits and will find a new power within themselves, within themselves to go on for greater service for the Lord. Because we can do none of this in and of ourselves. And I want to pick up where we left off, left off last week because we considered um, some marks, not, not, not exhaustive by any means, but we, we considered uh, some marks of the spurred and parred church. And if you, if you recall, some of the things we pulled out was the, the church that's in the will of God and, and spirit-led, well, there will be freedom in the house. It'll be a place that's full of grace. It'll be a place where there's a type of fame as we've seen with Christ, what that means is there'll be a report going out. A good, people will be talking about the church. A place where the Word of God is central and the people of God are able to teach and encourage one another, at least in the elementaries, how to be saved. Now, the, ch the church is Jesus Christ's body here on earth. And so when I look at Jesus, this is the type of man that I see. And this should reflect his church. I see a man that was rock solid, a man that was proved by God, a man who was full of goodness, a man who was full of grace and truth. He was a man of knowledge. He was a man who was able to teach and instruct both the pauper and the king. Because that's what the word does. It's applicable to all levels of society. And I believe that his church is empowered by the Spirit to reflect His image. We, we, of course, we believe that. And if the church is going to reflect Christ, here's the thing. She must follow the path that Christ Himself paved for her. Otherwise, we will not reflect Christ. And the path that has been laid out is what? It's the written Word. Now, there's many scriptures with the word path in it, but let's quote a simple one this morning that we all will know and can justify and confirm what I've just said. A Psalm 119, verse 105. And the psalmist writes, Your word is a lamp onto my feet. And I light to my path. <coughs> See, the path that we travel, if it's not God-ordained and Scripture-led, we will not reflect anything but the fleshly man or woman. You see that? If we, if we step outside of Scripture and we start 
enter in godly service, but we're not following the scriptures. It's ungodly service, and all will be on display as the man, the woman. So let's consider this morning, church, the path that Jesus walked. See that we can learn, because we can learn much from him. So godly habits that lead to godly service, and I want to just, just push through this quickly this morning. So the first godly habit is found in verse 16, if you want to look at your own scriptures. And in verse 16, we read something that we could very easily read over and miss. And it says this, as Jesus came to Nazareth, which was his hometown, the place where he was brought up, it says, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. As was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. What I see here to bring it into today's application, as was his custom, he went to church, if you like, on the Sabbath day. Now, listen, there's a danger here of legalism entering in. Now, you were all at church this morning, so this is no purse or dig which some men use. This is just simply, we're Bible teaching this morning. We're, we're observing. So, what, what we see here is that there is a type of legalism that could enter in here if we don't deal with this right. So, what this is not saying is that one must go to service or else. It's not saying that. But what it is telling us here is that Jesus had a godly habit, something that he wants you and I to see and observe. <coughs> he made it his practice to go to church on the Sabbath day. It was a godly habit that, that is recorded throughout Scripture. So if you want to know what Jesus did, if you want to know what it is to follow his example and to have godly habits, there is the most simplest but yet profound godly habit, what perhaps today has been neglected like never before. Not to use people here, because we're in church. We're just talking about what the Bible teaches. Church was part of Christ's life. And now, he didn't agree with a lot of things that took place in the synagogue, did he? But he made it his habit. And church was part of his life, and therefore, it should be a habit that should be found in the people of God. A habit, a godly habit. And out of the overflow of the Spirit... The believer will have a desire to be in the house of God and in the presence of God. In fact, that's why we're here today. It's out of this desire that we have within us to be in the presence of God. Not in the presence of, of anybody else, but in the presence of God. It's the desire that we have been given. Consider King David, one who loved the Lord and sought to live as such, a man who made many, many great mistakes. And if you want to know what ungodly service looks like, just consider King David. Consider what he did before the prophet Nathan come to his door. Now, he didn't resign from his throne. He didn't stop being David, the man after God's own heart. No, he continued on. But God knew that he was not living the way he ought. He had slipped off the narrow path and onto the broad road, and God knew, and God sent the prophet, the man of God, to his door and knocked the door. And King David repented. And if you read that text about that, David says he was actually broken in spirit. His bones were crushed. His countenance was crushed. He just couldn't. He couldn't just find a peace within his soul. No longer was the house of God a place of refuge for him because he was out of the will of the Lord, but he was, he was still serving God. He was in God, ungodly service, if you like. But out of the overflow, when David come back to the Lord and he repented, I want to see, show you the overflow that I see in the spirit, in David's spirit, when he pens the words in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Because you know what ungodly service does? Do you know when you're not in the place where you ought to be with God, it means the house of God is no longer a place of refuge. And that can be your place this morning. You can be in church and you cannot have any peace. You cannot experience the presence of God. You cannot be built up and encouraged. Why? What's wrong? Where have we stepped off? What have we been asked to do by the Lord? We're not doing it. That's as simple as it is. But David repented. He's done business with the Lord. And here he writes, I was glad. Church, I was glad. You see, that's what godly habits and godly obedience to the Word of God does. Because God will not let his people bluff. Thank God he doesn't let us bluff. he not leave us broken. Thank God he doesn't. And Jesus himself led, <clears throat> excuse me, by example, <clears throat> and he encourages his people to make public worship a godly habit. And godly habits will always lead to godly service. 
And ungodly habits will always lead to ungodly service. So that's the first point this morning. God, the first godly habit this morning is attend public worship. The second habit is endurance. Endurance is a habit, something we need to practice as well. And we know that Jesus endured for 40 days in the wilderness. I don't want to cover that again. I just want to remind you of that. He's just, he's just after enduring. He learned to endure there in the wilderness. But I want to bring us on up to the book of Hebrews. You don't need to turn to it for the sake of time, but I'll give reference. Hebrews 10 and 35. Now, listen to this. This, is, this text is about working out. And Paul writes this. He says, Do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. And what's Paul saying here? Paul is saying this. Listen, keep living for Christ. Don't lose your confidence that you have in him. Don't forget who you are and who it is that you serve. Don't lose your confidence in the man or the woman that you are of God. He goes on to say, if you have need of endurance, and perhaps one of the biggest killers in the church today is a, a generation coming up that has no endurance. But listen, endurance is something that the Lord Jesus had to learn. And he learned for us that we could too follow his path. It says, you have need of endurance, that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And here's the thing. This is my opinion anyway. Godly service, godly service doesn't come easy or naturally to us. It doesn't come easy. Would you agree with that, David? It doesn't come easy. Whether you're a pastor or whether you're a man or woman who just serves Jesus with your everyday life, it does not come easy to us. Godly service. It's very easy to do ungodly service because we can just bluff. But this is a call to godly service, to put on godly habits. And we must learn to endure in our faith and in Christian service. I often make a joke about times feeling like driving past the door. Have you ever thought how, how many times you felt like giving up? But you haven't. Because it's the spirit of endurance is given to the church. God has provided and equipped for his people. And, and what he has laid out as a path for us to follow, he's already equipped us to follow. And we must learn to trust him and to endure through hardship. Because godly service is to be at war with great evil. It's not a game. It's not a game. I can tell you it's not a game. Many a man, young man, has perish this side of eternity without Christ. And we can quite easily forget about it because we don't think about it too often. And quite easily, you too could have missed salvation this morning if you're saved. But by the grace of God and perhaps by faithfully, faithful men and women who, who took time to speak to you through godly habit and endurance, you're saved this morning. But godly service is not a game. It's a war for the souls of men. And it's a big battle. <coughs> But Hebrews 10 says this, it says, it's, it, it quotes Old Testament, it says, yet in a little while the common one will come, speaking about the return of Christ, and he will not delay. But my righteous one, the church, will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, now, talking about endurance, and it says, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now, if it stayed there, we would be beat. But the next verse says this, but we are not of those. We are not of those who shrink back. But of those who have faith and perseverance in their souls. And what Scripture is saying to you, church, is this. That you will be tempted many times to turn back from Christian service. You will feel at times that God is at best distant in your life. That will happen. You will feel at times that your life is no different from the wee wicked man up the end of the road. That will happen. You will have struggles. You will face sufferings. And in these moments, you will feel like selling your birthright. But it's in these times that the Spirit of God gives His church endurance and helps us through. Isn't that wonderful? You will never be broken beyond repair. We will never, our flame might become like a wee smoldering flax, but it will never, ever go out. And he says, wait on him, trust him, endure, and he will deliver you at the point of time. Because Paul says, 
Church, do not throw away your confidence. Keep following him. Get godly habits back into your life and godly service will naturally come. Get back to that place where you ought to be and do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. So godly habits will keep us in service. So we've, we've looked at attending public worship. We've considered a, a bit of endurance. <clears throat> we've, we, the next one is about having just faith in God. And Paul says, we are not of those who shrink back. See, faith is a gift of God and each believer has a measure of it. The reason you don't shrink back is not because you're strong in and of yourself. It's the work of God in us. It's all the work of God in us. The very fact that we're still surviving today, still going on with the Lord today, it's all of Him, church. Thank God it's all of Him. But we must make faith a godly habit. When our back is against the wall, when we feel like shrinking back, we must continue to trust God, to have faith in God when nothing makes sense. That's the challenge. Another godly habit will lead you to godly services as I said at the start, quite simple, but yet quite profound. Be in the Word. Now, I've noticed that life has gotten busy again. Are you busy again? Is anybody not as busy as they were? We're all busy again. Friday is just a blink. Sunday just as a blink. It just comes around. That's when you know you're busy. But can I encourage you, if you don't already, to take a wee bit of time a day and read a wee bit of portion of Scripture. Make it a godly habit. What time do you eat your breakfast at? What time do you do certain things at? If you can, you can just squeeze in 10 minutes. Godly habit. When we read a bit of Scripture, what I've noticed is it feeds the soul. It, it brings direction to the life and joy. And listen, many people think they don't need to be feeding on the Scriptures. One person told me, I'm free in Christ. I don't need the Word to know the Word. Well, Poor theology, to say the least. But John says this, John 8, 33. Jesus speaking, and he says to the Jews who've just believed, that's what the Bible says, so it's telling us something. They've just believed. They're now just saved. He doesn't say, now you're just saved, just you've trusted me, fine. You're great, see you in, turn, in eternity. So he's speaking to those who have just come to faith, and he says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Now, that's a sermon on its own. In verse 32, he says, Then you will know the truth, because you've been continuing the word. He says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Not a confession that you've come to faith, but the truth that is found in the word of God, the lamp that are our path is the word. And Jesus says, Listen, church, if you spend time in my word, you will be free, and you'll know the truth. <coughs> Jesus knew the word, and he quoted it often. So what I'm going to say is what I've said to myself. See, this is like a study book to a preacher. That's the problem at times. But to have fellowship with God is not to, to just study the Word, but to, 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 to fellowship with the Word and just to get it into you. But we are to let the Bible be part of our life to make it a godly habit. Now, Jesus used the Scripture to expose Satan's lies and deception against his life. And listen, you're going to need the Scriptures to expose the lies and the deception that Satan's placing before your life. It's as simple as that. That's how Jesus counteracted and exposed Satan's deception through the Word, and that's how we will do it. So godly habits lead to godly service. That's my launch pad this morning. Public worship, endurance, faith in the Word, and faith in God and be in the Word. And that brings us to verse 16. And here we see that Jesus himself opens the Scriptures for godly service. And this is where his godly service begins. And he stands and he reads from Isaiah 61, and he starts off with, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. We're told then he sits down to teach in the synagogue. Now, we know that uh, it was custom for the teacher to stand to read the word and sit to teach the word, and that's what that means. But Jesus says something profound to them here as he begins to teach. Now, you imagine I read... Isaiah 61, and as I finished reading that bit, I says to you, right, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. If you were half with it at all and listened this morning, you'd throw your Bible at me. Jesus said something profound. In other words, Jesus said, I am the Messiah, the promised Redeemer, the servant of God. I am him. See, Isaiah 61, Jesus, that Jesus read, it's a prophecy concerning the promised Messiah. 
And what we notice is the promised Messiah comes as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. See that? And of course, we've already noted in this past few weeks that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And after being proved of God, he returned home in the power of the Spirit. You remember, remember that? What's, notice the opening words of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's anointed me. See, Jesus is tying it all up. And the Messiah was now standing before the people in the synagogue. The written word, the logos, the living word, was now standing in their presence in the tangible. See, the problem is, we listen to preaching week in, week out, and it just becomes blah. They had done that for years. Blah, blah. It's all they heard, blah. But when the very presence of God was in their midst, they still couldn't see it. They hadn't been in the Word. They didn't know truth, and they rejected Him. Do you see the danger of blah every week? Do you see the danger of not setting godly habits and getting into godly service and having a true living relationship with the Lord Jesus every day? Do you see the danger? And so it is today, the Lord is in the midst of His people. And listen, I want to just say this because principles are just principles. Godly habits are, are great gain, but they're principles. And they will help you. But the power of the Spirit has so much more to offer. Yes, it might help us attend service. It might, might help us read the Word and to deepen our faith, but it's got so much more than that. It empowers the church for godly service. And the path that Jesus led tells us that godly habits will lead us to greater service in the gospel. So the church is called and equipped to set people free from bondage of sin. Christian, I just want to say this to you this morning. Because it's hard to sometimes see where God is in your life when church is just once a week and whatever's in between. But I want to just say this to you as a Christian this morning. The place where you stand in, on a Monday or on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, the week that you live, the place where you find yourself in is the place that God has planted you. See, when you look at it through a missional point of view, all of a sudden it all changes. It all becomes relevant. All of a sudden you've got purpose. Your dead-end job or the job that you despise, it's not by chance that you're there. If you're a business leader of the day, it's not by chance you've got influence over people. You see, you're planted where you are because that's where God has us. It's not always a place we want to be, is it, to be honest? But it's where he's planted us. He's planted you there to be a witness to others. And you may say that you don't have what it takes. I say that every day. We could all surely say that, couldn't we? We don't have what it takes. But one commentator said this. He says, when God calls, he anoints. He equips the messenger with the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit goes with the messenger wherever God sends him. For God has planted you, church. You're not alone. There's a power with you. And Christian, I believe this and I've proved it in my own life as I considered what I'm about to say. When we practice godly habits, we begin to realize that we do indeed carry a different power source that's not of this world. Have you experienced that? I'm sure we have. Power to witness, power to share, power to stand out from the crowd and not go with the flow of this world. And when we, when we practice godly principles and godly habits, we, we begin to sense his presence more in our life. We begin to follow the old godly paths that Scripture has led for us. Not the new modern liberal paths that we paved for ourselves, but the godly old paths, the hard road that we must travel. We begin to serve the Lord each day. The Messiah was to preach the gospel, church. The word gospel in the Hebrew is good news, but in Latin it means to evangelize. You're an evangelist, Christian. You're a missionary. Wherever you're planted, that's your mission field. That's what the gospel is. He, he saves and he sends out his people. Some go to Africa and beyond. Many of us go to our workplaces. That's the mission field. Now, I'm going to bring this in. Time goes fast up here. The Messiah was to preach the two classes of people. The poor in spirit, and which is also the poor in material, and the captive. Now, if you look into that word, the captive, it speaks of one who is a prisoner. Now, here's the thing. 
According to Scripture, all men are bound by sin. Rich or poor. Without Christ, you're bound. And here's what the gospel simply is. The church, we are to bring the gospel to all men, both rich and poor, of all sizes. The church is God's chosen vessel to bring salvation to the world. And if you're saved, you're God's vessel. You're God's chosen vessel. To remind people about God, have you been doing that? Because that's your, that's your, that's your chore. That's what you've been asked to do. Now, I see very quickly a threefold ministry that Jesus does here, and this is the power that you have to change. He was to heal the brokenhearted. And the ministry of the church carries a power. We are empowered to heal people with the gospel. Who are the brokenhearted? Are those who are crushed by grief. Those whose lives have been shattered into many pieces by this sinful world. Those who believe their life's finished. Is that you this morning? You believe your life's finished. Nothing to live for. It seems to be the theme of many people in these days of nothing to live for. Yet we carry a message that brings hope. That's what it teaches. The longing soul can be healed. Is your soul longing this morning? Christ can satisfy that longing soul. We're called to draw, we're called to draw near those who are cut off. And here's the thing. We're to tell the man who's been destroyed by sin that there's hope. We're to tell the woman who's been violated by sin that she can be restored. That's what the message of the gospel is. It goes on to say that he was to give sight to the blind. And maybe you're listening to this this morning and you just can't see a way forward in life. That's what sin does. It blinds, destroys. But the Bible says that he came to open our eyes. When Christ opens our eyes, we begin to see things. We begin to see God where he is and see life. If you feel that your life is somewhat over and all you can see around you is death and brokenness and despair, we need to remind people that Jesus came to open the eyes and to give life. And when Jesus opens the eye of a man, he no, he no longer sees his hopelessness. He sees God. He sees eternity. And he becomes a worshiper of God. I want to finish this off. I'm going to miss a bit and go right to the end. I want to, we've looked at godly habits that lead to godly service. And here's the thing, church, Christian. What about the urgency of the call? Is there an urgency of the call? Why do we do what we do? If you serve in this church and, and ministry, why do you do it? Why do I do what I do? Is because I love stress. Is because I love questioning myself weekly. That's what happens. Is it because I say, if you know something, I'll put my desires last because I'll get it in eternity. Why do you do what you do? Here's why I do what I do. At 24 years of age, broken, lost, without hope, life and soul of the party wanted to die. And he lifted me and he changed me. And if I can change or see one life change through my ministry, that's why I do what I do. Why do I preach Christ? Because I know what he did for me. Now, I'm going to ask you again. Why do you do what you do? Is it for a church? You're doing it for the wrong reason. Is it to find self-worth? You're doing it for the wrong reason. Is it to do it for the Lord? Because it breaks his heart to see a man or woman go into eternity without Christ. Because that's what the Bible teaches. And this is what the Lord says. He says, the church is called to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, this is a day of grace. It's called the church age. And the time is coming when the door will close. We see it pictured in the ark. Noah preached for 120 years repentance and righteousness and they all mocked the great atheistic world that we live in now was his experience and nobody come and I want to know what it said it said the Lord closed the ark it wasn't Noah and the time will come and the scriptures teach that the day of grace will be over and the door of salvation will be closed and God will retract his arm because at the moment of his arms outstretched to save whosoever will and I'm going to ask you again church why do you do what you do? And if you get that bit right, you see the godly habits. 
They don't become chores. They fall into place. See, the godly service is not a habit. It's not something you have to persevere with. It falls into place. Because everything gets its perspective. We're here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, if you have taught a child, taught a Sunday school, taught at the Bible class, if you preached from this pulpit, or you shared Jesus with anybody else, you're in the, so, the business of winning souls. But see, if we allow ourselves to get caught up with all the wrong things, what do we end up doing? Creating bad habits. Bad habits that our children will follow, by the way, and learn. We'll end up doing ungodly service because we're not doing it with the right heart. And God doesn't bless it. So church, my time is completely finished. And I'm going to just stop it there. But what about a call to renewed godly service? What about it? What about asking why we do it? And you'll find you get an energy to do it. Amen? So Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. And Father, we can look at godly habits all we want, but Father, if our eye is not fixed on you, it's all just works. And Father, I pray this morning that, Lord, you would, Lord, pour that oil and wine over your church again this morning. God, stir us up. Lord, refresh us and build us up, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that godly service, God, would just come naturally to us. That, Lord, we would be a church that would go and Lord, tell the brokenhearted they can be healed. To tell those who's bound by sin that they can be set free. Father, that we would carry with us, with us, God, the message of the gospel, trusting that God would do the rest. Lord, we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the team just to come, please. So time goes.